For our first event together, we're so pleased to be welcoming Thalia Holt for Rise of the Rocket Girls, the women who propelled us from missiles to the moon to Mars. Throughout her career, Nathalia has focused on telling serious science stories through a human lens, culminating in published work in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Popular Science, Time, and her first book, Cured, The People Who Defeated HIV. In Rise of the Rocket Girls, Nathalia examines the story of a group of elite young women at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory who were brought together by their deep love of math and whose work influenced military rocket design, brought us the first American satellite, and shaped many lunar missions. I loved what Nature Magazine wrote about it. Holt carefully lays out practical problems, such as the need to minimize fuel weight while ensuring that a rocket could reach escape velocity, and how mathematics helped solve them. Here, math is dramatic, not mundane. Calculating is a physical, even athletic act. So great. Interwoven with this athletic math are also the real life stories of the women themselves and the difficulties they'd endured in a male dominated field and the lasting impact of their work. Please help me welcome Nathalia Holt to It's Science at Bus Boys and Poets. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here tonight. And I want to talk about the Rocket Girls. And I came across this story in a very unusual way. In 2010, my husband and I were expecting a baby, and we were having a really difficult time coming up with baby names. My husband suggested Eleanor Francis, and I wasn't sure. The name seemed a little bit old-fashioned to me, so I did what parents do these days, and I Googled the name. And the first person that popped up was a woman named Eleanor Francis Helene. And there was this beautiful picture of her, and she's accepting an award at NASA in the 1960s. And I was just stunned by this picture because I had no idea that women worked at NASA at this time, much less as scientists. So I wanted to learn more. And I found out that Eleanor Francis wasn't alone. She was actually one of a large group of women who started at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, called JPL in the 1940s. And these women worked as computers. So before the digital devices we have today, a computer simply referred to a person who computes. So these women were very good at math. And the lab started with kind of an unusual group. They're called the Suicide Squad. And they were a rambunctious group of men who did very, very reckless experiments. At the time, rocket science was considered a fringe science. It wasn't something a serious scientist would work on. And there was even this feeling in the scientific community that it was worthless, that you would never be able to get a rocket to penetrate Earth's atmosphere. And so these, this group, a few of whom were Caltech students, were setting off rockets and doing different experiments on the campus, and they were just causing havoc. They sent up this plume of of gas that destroyed landscaping at the university. And they then set off an explosion in a building that ended up rusting a very expensive wind tunnel. Uh, and then finally, they actually exploded off a piece of a building. And at this point, Caltech finally said, OK, you guys are out. No more experiments on campus. So they went to this remote canyon in Pasadena and started setting off their rockets there. And finally, through some luck and perseverance, they were able to get a small grant uh, from the US government. And this was actually the government's first investment in rocket science. And with this grant, they hired a few computers. And so they hired Richard and Barbie Canwright. And they were both very good at math. And these, this group spent their time working on something called JADO is jet assisted takeoff and they were essentially just strapping rockets to an airplane and the hope was that they could make this technology work to one day lift bombers in the air and they had some success here is the group and you can see Barbie is the one in a skirt kind of off to the side um, and with this success they got another grant from the US government and now Richard Canwright was promoted so he was made an engineer but Barbie wasn't and this was to be expected. Men were engineers and women weren't. 
And quite frankly, she was very happy to be a computer because for a woman interested in math and science, there were very few career options. So she was glad to have this job. So with Richard promoted, they needed more computers. And so they hired two men and a woman. And one of those women was Macy Roberts. Now Macy was made supervisor of the computers in 1942, and she had a, a quite a lasting influence on in the laboratory. So she decided, once she was made supervisor, that she was only going to hire women. And so men would apply to this group and would be rejected. Today this would be a lawsuit. But, uh, but then the idea that was that she wanted to create a cohesive group that felt like a family. And she worried that if she hired a man, they, they just wouldn't be able to listen to her as a female boss. And so she hired quite a few women. She had a large group. They had all different kinds of backgrounds. Some of them had bachelor degrees. So you can see Janez Lawson is right in the middle. She was the first African American to be hired in a technical position at the lab. And she had a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from UCLA. So today she would be hired as an engineer. Back then she was hired as a computer. Um, but they had a range of backgrounds. Some of them only had high school diplomas, but they all were incredibly skilled at math and they often were the only girls in their math and science classes in high school. And so these women worked with just paper and pencil. They had slide rules and they also had something called a Frieden calculator, which was kind of this big boxy machine. It looks really complicated, but it can only do basic things like addition and subtraction. Some later models could do square roots and this was very exciting. Um, and so with just these bare tools, uh, they worked on the first missiles. So they worked on the corporal and the sergeant. And these missiles never had a lot of importance in terms of military might, but they did become very important in space exploration. And so we see this on October 4th, 1957, when the Soviets launched Sputnik. And at JPL, the staff is seething because they knew if they'd just been given a chance, they could have launched the world's first satellite a year earlier. And now, finally, with the launch of a second Sputnik, there's enough pressure put on the Eisenhower administration that JPL gets the go ahead. And so the women use their calculations for the Sargent missile for the satellite. And what they end up doing is strapping together a bunch of model Sargent missiles. So these aren't the full missiles, but they're a smaller version that the women call baby sergeants. And so they strap together three different tubs of these baby sergeants, and they're all set on top of a big redstone rocket. And at the very top is Explorer 1, America's first satellite. And on January 31st, 1958, they launch this rocket. And that night in the control room, there are several women working, but probably none is more important than Barbara Paulson. And so Barbara Paulson at that point has already worked in the lab for about a decade. She started when she was a teenager. And this night on January 31st, she is the one calculating the trajectory of the satellite as it leaves Earth. And so everyone is waiting for her calculations. And so behind her, looking over her shoulder, are Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, and Lee Dubridge, who is then president of Caltech. Everyone is waiting for her calculations. And when she finally figures out that yes, Explorer 1 has made it, it is officially America's first satellite, the room just erupts in celebration. It's an exciting moment. Um, and in that moment, it's also the birth of NASA. Everything changes right there. And so now the women leave behind weaponry forever and they only concentrate on space exploration. They begin working on the first probes to the moon, to the planets, to Mars and Venus. And with these new missions come very late hours. They're now working long days, and during a launch itself, they are frequently there all night. And this is all happening at the same time that they're starting to get married and have families. Um, this is Barbara Paulson getting married in 1958. And at the time, in 1960, only 25% of mothers worked outside the home. And so for the women, 
Uh, they, you know, they had no maternity leave, so they really had to rely on one another to make this happen. It was really because of their close relationships they were able to make it through this time. Um, and there were other changes happening. IBMs were starting to come into the lab. And what I found in my research is that at other NASA centers, when IBMs came in, the people who worked as computers were usually fired. But this didn't happen at JPL. And what surprised me is that there was a lot of mistrust of these IBMs. There was a feeling that they were not reliable, that they would just flare up. And because of that, it was the women that became the first computer programmers at the lab. Um, and so this is the IBM 1620. And it has a, a very special role in the book because the, the women end up christening it Cora. She kind of becomes a member of the group. She gets her own name on the outside of the door along with all their names. Um, and so they have a very close relationship with the computers they work at with. So while they're working with all of this brand new technology, they're also dealing with gender norms at the time. And some of those were beauty contests. So the lab held a misguided missile contest that Barbara Paulson <laughs> participated in, uh, later became queen of outer space. And it, it seems so arcane and ridiculous by today's standards, but in a way, it, it's actually reflective of the progressive hiring policies at JPL. No other NASA center could have held a beauty contest because they simply didn't hire enough women. Um, and, and also these social events, as silly as they are, they, they really brought the lab together. And what I found is that the male colleagues and the women at JPL had these very close relationships and when it came to be publication time, the men actually included the women computers on their papers. And this was very unusual at the time and made a very big difference in the longevity of their careers. So by the late 1960s, things are changing and they're no longer called computers. They are now finally given the very coveted title of engineer. And this is a big moment for the women. They're very excited to finally be engineers finally get paid uh, as much as their male colleagues. Um, and important here is a woman named Helen Lang. So she was made supervisor after Macy Roberts retired. And so she had, so when she became an engineer, she decided that she really wanted to increase the number of women engineers in the lab. And to do that, she specifically sought to hire women who had bachelor's degrees in math or computer science but didn't have engineering degrees. And so she would hire them and then encourage them to go to night school. And because of her, the lab just filled with women engineers. One of those was a woman named Sylvia Miller. So she was hired uh, by Helen Lang in 1967. She then went to night school in engineering. And she became part of this really exciting group um, that were working on a project called the Grand Tour. So they wanted to explore the solar system. And then unfortunately, in the early 70s, this project got canceled. So what this group did, Sylvia Miller and this kind of small group of engineers here, is they came in one weekend and they figured, well, is there some way that we can economically explore the solar system with this mission to Saturn? And so they figured out a way to use gravity assist and make this trajectory that would allow them to do this and would allow them to explore beyond Saturn and to be able to go to Neptune and Uranus. And in 1977, they launched the Voyagers. And so this is what the project became. So out of this really hush-hush weekend project, this really exciting exploration happened. Um, and, and so because of the work they did, they were able to give us these rare glimpses into the planets. And one of the Voyagers has now left the solar system. It's the first human-made object in outer space. And this was a very surprising story about the origins um, that I learned from Sylvia. And Sylvia had an amazing career. She went on to become director of the Mars Program Office. And she worked with her friends. She worked with Helen Ling and Barbara Paulson and Sue Finley on Mars rovers. This is a picture from Mars Opportunity, which is still roaming the planet today. And so it's all of their programs that have made these rovers possible. And these women have, have just had incredible careers. They've had 40, 50, 
even 60 here careers at NASA and their, their work has touched just about every NASA mission that you can think of. Um, but I was really shocked at the lack of recognition that they've received. And so we see this in 2008 uh, when NASA held a big gala in honor of Explorer 1. So this was the 50th anniversary of America's first satellite, but they left off the guest list the women that worked on that mission. So Barbara Paulson, even though she was such a critical part of that night's success, wasn't invited to that party. Um, and perhaps even more heartbreaking is the story of Sue Finley. So Sue Finley is NASA's longest serving woman. She's worked there for 58 years. And in 2004, NASA decided that if you don't have a bachelor's degree, you are, can no longer be called an engineer. And so because Sue was hired at a time before bachelor's degrees were considered a prerequisite, her position was taken away and she was switched to an hourly salary and called a technician, even though she's still working as a systems engineer. Um, and this is just such a shame because she loves her job. She is currently working on Juno, our mission to Jupiter, and she uh, is very fond of her, her long career at JPL. So it's a shame that, that she's been treated this way and that she now has to fill out time cards. So this is Eleanor Francis today. She's five years old and she's named in part for a woman who I've never met, um, but whose story I really hope that she will find inspiring one day. And thank you all so much for coming. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. I have a mic if anyone would like um, to ask any questions. Also, I just wanted to remind you um, that our partner at space.com has been so kind and there's a lot of really cool stuff over here. Um, some t-shirts and everything that they provided. Anyone have a question? I see one. Hi. Um, thank you very much for telling this story and these women's stories. Can you talk a bit about their attitudes to the way they were treated over the years? What's the sort of mix of gratitude that they got to do this at all versus anger that they were not treated as equals in so many ways? Yeah, so you know, they, uh, they are very grateful for their careers at JPL. They loved working in the lab. They, they loved the missions that they worked on. Um, and you know, during these careers, they really felt like they were valued very highly. They felt like they were on par with their male engineering colleagues in a way that other women who worked at the lab weren't. So they felt very special during this time. Um, and so the only thing that really mars that feeling of gratitude and, and their happiness at the lab is, is kind of, is, is the more recent events. So that is more the sadder part to me, is that now, looking back, their stories really have been forgotten. You know, even at JPL, at this lab that they've spent decades working at. Um, so that is, you know, that, that does upset them. But despite that, they really loved their time working at the lab. I'll ask one. Hello. Uh, you said you were shocked. That's the word you used. Shocked by the uh, lack of recognition. Can you speak more to that, please? Yeah, I, it really surprised me because, you know, when I first started learning about these women, I, I contacted the archives at JPL, and they had all of these wonderful pictures of women in the 1950s, but they had very few of their names and they had no contact information at all. So it was quite difficult just to find them and learn their stories. And, and this was really surprising to me that you could work at a lab for 50 years and yet your story would just kind of vanish. Um, and especially, you know, the lack of recognition for Sue Finley, I think, is, is really unacceptable. That's something we need to change. Uh, thank you very, very much. I'm eager to read your book. You mentioned that, um, and I've forgotten the name of the woman who decided to hire only women. Uh, so there would be the camaraderie and the sense of family. At some point, there must have been a male hired 
because it can't still be that way today. Um, <laughs> so do you know anything about when that happened and whether it undermined the camaraderie or whether the camaraderie was so well established that it persisted? Yeah, so they, you know, they started out as the computing section with Macy Roberts, so that started in the 1940s, and then that went on for a few decades, and then in the 1960s it became called Mission Design. Uh, they were still known as computers at that time, and they had another woman supervisor named Helen Lang who continued that tradition of only hiring women, and then she actually continued that until she retired in 1994. Um, which I know is kind of unbelievable. I don't know how she got away with that, but she hired all women and she specifically looked for women who she felt like would make a great contribution and would do well in engineering. Um, and then when she left, actually that, that section kind of got and broke up. So really no men ever invaded the women who worked as computers at JPL. <laughs> But they did have, one thing that I thought was kind of funny is they did have, um, in the 50s, they had a few men, engineers, who spent so much time in their room that they ended up giving them women names. So they had Leona and Bubbles, who were two male engineers that they christened as part of the women in the group. <laughs> um, I, I was quite shocked to hear about, you know, Sue Finley and what happened to her so recently um, and I suppose what I wanted to ask is uh, sort of comparing the situation sort of maybe 50 years, 60 years ago with uh, the prospects of, of young women who are in, who want to go into engineering who want to go into rocket science what what is the gender balance like today for people looking to get into those careers and if there is an imbalance where do you think that begins is it is it at a college level or at a high school level or is it kind of uh, sort of even before then yeah, you know, it's, it's actually a very dire situation uh, for women in technology right now. In 1984, 37% of bachelor degrees in computer science were conferred to women, and today that number has dropped to 18%. Um, so it is, it's a, a really desperate situation. I, I think there's many different reasons why that's happened. Um, but my, you know, my hope is that by having these women kind of brought out into the spotlight a little bit, that they can serve as role models and, and help inspire young women today who are interested in science. I often think, you know, for me, I often, during moments that I have found, found difficult, I often think, well, if Barbara Paulson did this in 1959, I'm, I'm sure I can do it today. So I think there is something, something to that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your research process for the book. Um, how you piece these women's lives together? Was it mostly interviews or did you, you know, use primary sources at JPL? Yeah, I was able to track down a large number of the women um, and, do, and have interviews directly with them, which was wonderful. I also worked really closely with the archivists and historians at JPL and at Caltech, um, and so I was able to get access to a lot of documents that way that was very helpful. Perhaps the most key thing for me was I held a reunion in 2013 where I had a number of women uh, come back to the lab from all over the country. And this was a really special event because we toured the lab together and, and being there with them, it just brought all the memories coming back and it was a really special event. And was JPL supportive of the project or did you kind of receive resistance from them and from NASA? No, they've been, they've been very supportive. They've been very helpful. I'm so thankful. I could not have done it without the archivist there. And I know it, you know, I think for them it's, it's you know, it's a big bureaucracy, so it's not, not so easy to, to change things quickly. Um, but there's been a great reaction to the book, and my hope is that things will change there soon in terms of getting recognition for the women. Um, if we don't, oh. I want to say, first of all, congratulations on writing the book. Uh, second of all, congratulations on writing a book that targets a group of people who made a big contribution that have been forgotten. I want to draw you out a little bit, though, about the broader issue of women in science. One is I note in your, in your talk, you didn't mention that you yourself are a PhD. And sort of in terms of doing your own research on the Rocket Girls and your own experience, what advice do you have or what do you hope will be done to increase the number of women who choose the sciences as opposed to 
other careers. Oh, and by the way, how is Eleanor Francis? <laughs> and her sister. <laughs> yes, Eleanor Francis is doing well. Um, you know, I, I think about this a lot because I, you know, especially having daughters, you, you want to make the world better for them. You want to make it easier for them in case they decide to pursue science. Um, and I, I think that there's, you know, the, it's a complicated answer about how we can increase women in science. But there are lessons that you can draw from this book. There are, are a number of institutional policies that JPL had in the 50s and 60s that made it easier for women to be working there and to be working on the missions there. Um, and then there's also the fact that it was an all-women group with a female supervisor. You know, I think there's, there's many barriers in education and sexism that occurs today in science that prevents women from going into the field. Um, and so kind of going back and seeing how they did it, how they were able to overcome it, is, is, a, is a useful way, I think, to look at what's happening today. So I have a two-part question. Um, the first is, uh, could you talk a little bit about your process as a writer? So we know where the genesis for the story idea came from, but you know how you go through the process of, of tackling something like this. And then uh, I just happened to know a young woman who is an aspiring scientist and an astronaut. Um, and in addition to that, she's she's a voracious reader and writer herself. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about perhaps the conflict that appears to exist between being sort of literate's not the right word to use, but literary versus scientific. Because um, I, I like to hope that she'll become sort of a Renaissance woman and perhaps through that bring a different perspective to the science and the exploration that someone who can, who can write and communicate that story more effectively could do. Well, that's a great question. Yeah, well, you know, for me, when I got started on this, it. I wasn't necessarily thinking that I would write this about this as a book. I, I really was just a question I was obsessed with. I really wanted to learn more about them. And it took quite a while before I finally reached the point where I felt like I had to tell the story. So it was probably you know, a good three years before I, I finally got to that point. And even when I held a reunion of the computers at JPL and had all of these women here and had really put quite a lot of energy into researching this book, I still didn't have a book deal. So it was definitely risking a lot up front uh, to try to get this done and to make this project happen. But I think it's, it is such a wonderful time for young women that are interested in, in science and are interested in writing. We have, for the first time, we have our class of astronauts that's half women. Um, and what we have right now happening in science writing is very exciting too, because it's just, there's so many wonderful books and wonderful stories being told. And I think there's a lot of inspiration in that class of young astronauts. There's many of them who have written beautiful things. So it certainly can be done, and I know she's going to do very well at it. <laughs> Is there any science writing that's especially inspired you or that you would um, recommend to our young friend? <laughs> <laughs> there's quite a bit. Um, you know, for this book, I was really inspired by a lot of narrative nonfiction that's been written previously. I, I really loved The Girls of Atomic City. I felt like that book was, was really wonderful and the stories it told and, and the structure of it was also very helpful while writing a, sim, a book that's also about a group of women. Um, but yeah, there are so many great books out there. I think we're all set. I was where? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I missed you. If you could talk to the aerospace community as a whole, knowing what you know with the research you've done, what kind of things would you suggest or emphasize that they do to encourage young women in the engineering field? I think recognizing our history in aerospace is an, an important part of that, to not see this as reinventing the wheel and that we have to bring women in, that actually women have been a part of this from the beginning think is an important part of that message. All right. That's thank it. you so much, Nathalia. Thank um, you. And thank you to space.com as well. Nathalia will be signing books right over here in the corner. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>